good morning everyone welcome to yet another edition of uh, isc master class uh, last time we had a discussion on chronic pancreatitis and the lecture was given by dr manu tandan and uh, it was a wonderful lecture uh, today we have a uh, we are moving to one other module on master class and i discussed with you all uh, last week that we are going to start a series of seven uh, master classes on gi cancer and uh, uh, we, in that series we have the first talk today that's on gi lymphoma uh, and uh, we believe that gi lymphoma is an important part and parcel of uh, uh, gastroenterologist practice and uh, we as we know that uh, all gi uh, all gi cancer are they require multimodality approach they require multidisciplinary uh, a collaboration uh, for appropriate treatment of uh, uh, the cancer and and we also know that in our country we don't have very well aisle system for treating uh, uh, all cancers because they uh, only have some institutions who have uh, run tumor boards otherwise uh, many many patients of uh, cancers are treated on individual basis uh, while we know that uh, uh, most cancer will require a, a collaboration between uh, multiple specialists uh, in the oncology so to, coming back to today's uh, talk this is uh, gastrointestinal lymphoma and this talk will be this uh, talk talk panel discussion will be moderated by dr k m mohandas uh, which is a uh, very popular amongst all gastroenterologists and and uh, uh, he had been uh, at uh, tata memorial center in mumbai and for last about 10 years he is in tata medical center in kolkata and he heads department of digestive diseases at uh, Uh, Tata Medical Center in Kolkata. So he will uh, first speak to us on GI lymphoma and overview, and then lead the panel discussion. Uh, we for this panel we have again a very very uh, esteemed panelist, uh, starting with Dr. Prasi uh, Prasi Patil. Uh, she is uh, at uh, Tata Medical uh, Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai. Uh, she is again a professor in Department of uh, Gastrointestinal uh, Sciences. we have a uh, navin khatri again from uh, uh, navin khatri is a medical oncologist uh, he is a professor at tata memorial center in mumbai and uh, he was trained earlier at aims uh, and uh, we have a third panelist uh, dr rimpa basuachari and uh, she is at uh, uh, she is a radiation oncology senior consultant at uh, tata medical center with this uh, i request dr saraswat to uh, to welcome you all and then we go to talk by talk and panel discussion to kar sarasat please uh, thank you govind uh, good morning to all the participants and a warm welcome to this edition of the isg uh, as uh, professor makharia has already has just told you we uh, have been doing single topic master classes so far for the last 4 months almost 24 of them i believe this is the probably the 25th uh, session uh, that we are uh, hosting and uh, we thought that now we would uh, have a slight change in the format and move to more panel discussions and focus on the area of uh, gi oncology uh, gastrointestinal cancers as you all know in the last couple of decades there have been huge advances in most areas of uh, medicine and gastroenterology but particularly uh, so in oncology as also in hepatology and gastro gi imaging and uh, so on so we seem to be now at a point in the evolution of the super speciality of gastroenterology at which uh, the um, speciality of medicine was somewhere in the 1960s that is it is now poised from gastroenterology appears to be more like a broad speciality like medicine and uh, which is now leading to specializations branching out we already had the pediatric gastroenterologists branch out quite a while ago about two decades or so ago hepatology which has branched out from gastroenterology is a very flourishing uh, field in its own right and a similarly advanced gi endoscopy different endoscopic techniques us based third space endoscopy um, digital uh, imaging etc are coming up in such a big way that they almost become specialities in their own right 
and very much in this mix we now have gi oncology all of us are familiar with medical oncology which is a rapidly growing department and large number of departments of medical oncology in the public and the private sector have come up in the last uh, decade or so uh, and well it's probably about time that we a qualified dm dnb gastroenterologist started looking at a career and a future in gi oncology not just uh, the basics the diagnostic and the palliative part but the entire gamut of gi oncology so so these few words we thought it would be an opportune time to have gi oncology and for today's session as the professor makhari has already introduced a very distinguished and an esteemed panel uh, led by uh, professor k m mohandas who is uh, probably not be wrong to say that he is the dean of the budding specialty of gi oncology in this country a very well um, uh, known and a highly reputed name in gi oncology uh, with these few words i now invite professor mohandas to initiate today today's discussion on gi lymphoma professor mohandas please I cannot see the. The slides have come. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon to everyone, and also being a Malayali, I would like to wish all of you a happy Onam. Uh, in COVID times, things are a bit dif difficult. So, without uh, any further delay, I would like to get on to the uh, initial introductory talk on GI lymphomas. So, see, this is a this was my first. gastroenterology paper that i read at isg in 1987 33 years ago and it was on primary gastric lymphomas and in that we had concluded that primary gastric lymphomas are not uncommon endoscopic biopsies are very useful accurate preoperative staging is needed to avoid unnecessary surgery and multimodality treatment is likely to result in best results so let us see how things have changed in the next 33 years that are that has followed so regarding the pathogenesis of uh, lymphoma lymphomas are a heterogeneous group of neoplasms that arise in the lymphoid tissues so we have uh, lymph nodes in the abdomen which are mostly in relation to the large and the small bowel and uh, of course esophagus and stomach as well in addition to that there are lymphoid tissue in the pears patches of large and small bowel and the stomach which is generally devoid of lymphoid follicles go on to develop lymphoid follicles when infected with h pylori for a long time so this is an acquired mart in the stomach pears patches lymph nodes in the abdomen all of these are potential sites for the development of lymphomas of the gi tract how does cancer develop in general there are three sequential hits that happens to driver genes these are these driver genes are either oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes and that finally results in malignant transformations these hits may be random happening as the person is growing old or it may be caused by environmental factors like viral infection or pesticides and such things in for lymphomas and in a few cases they are inherited so you have the normal epithelium that is the first hit then you get a clone with just one hit uh, there is a hit in the that clone resulting in a second hit and a third hit and then finally there is malignant transformation as far as the gi lymphomas are concerned depending on the type of the gi lymphomas there are a large number of translocations that are associated you need not go into the details but i just listed here mult mantle follicular anaplastic each of these uh, are frequently associated with various uh, translocations 
So if you look for a little more de <coughs> details, helicobacter pylori, which is so common all over the world, as well as in India, it, uh, it causes a chronic infection in a large majority of patients. And most, more commonly, it causes gastric adenocarcinoma. So we will forget that for the time being. In a small proportion of patients, the acquired mold that develops in the stomach, as I told you just now, undergoes various hits, and there is a, a carcinogenesis triggered in that, resulting in a mild lymphoma. This mild lymphoma, the vast majority, two-thirds are S. pylori dependent in the very early stage. So if you eradicate H. pylori at this stage, you can cause a regression of this mild lymphoma and the patient will not progress to more higher grades. However, further hits can result in the mild lymphoma becoming H. pylori independent. And finally, it can be transformed into a, a more higher grade lymphoma like a DLPCL. A smaller percentage, two -third, one, one quarter of the patients, develop the same mild lymphoma, but these are to begin with H. pylori independent. And therefore, even if you eradicate the H. pylori, these lymphomas are likely to progress and get transformed in the long run. What is the burden of lymphomas in general and GI lymphomas in particular in our country? In general, there is an increase in the incidence of lymphomas in India, but the survival in India is very poor. So just to take a global snapshot, this is in the US, there are about 13 cases per lakh population, new cases of lymphomas. And in India, there is about two cases. So you can see six-fold higher in US as compared to India. But if you look at the mortality, you see in US, the mortality is just about 20% of this 12 per lakh, whereas in India, it is 82%. That is, we have a four times higher mortality from various lymphomas in this country for various reasons. We diagnose them late, we don't treat them properly, and many don't get even treated, and so there are various reasons for that. This is an epidemiology paper on lymphomas we published a few years ago in oncology. Basically, the lymphomas have been rising in India as it has been rising in other parts of the world. But if you look at the mortality uh, patterns, you can see that the mortality, the five-year survival is low. It's less than 40% in most parts of India. In, in Mumbai, it is 35%. Whereas if you look at other Asian countries, Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, et cetera, Korea, et cetera, you can see it's going all the way up to 65, 70 uh, patients are person, patients are surviving for five years. <clears throat> Lympho lymphomas are of very many types, and over the last 30 years, the typing, subtyping has changed many times. So now it is mandatory to use immunohistochemistry, cytogenetics, flow cytometry techniques, as well as next gen sequencing for subtyping. In 2016, the WHO published the revised classification. So chapter 13 is B-cell lymphomas. There are about 32 subtypes. And then there is a T-cell lymphomas, which are about 20 subtypes. So you can see 50 more, 50 plus subtypes of various types of lymphomas. And these are basically dependent on the stage of evolution of the B-cells. So uh, you know, the mature B cell lymphomas are the ones that we are talking about. Uh, if it's because of, they become leukemias and more advanced plasma cells, they result in myeloma. So, CD20 is something that is present in all of our lymphoma, B cell lymphomas, and that is extensively used for, uh, you know, classifying. Similarly, with the T cells, we are talking about mature thymocyte and mature T cell derived lymphomas. And here again, CD3 is something that is present in these lymphomas, and they are used to identify T cell lymphomas. So, in general, 90% of GI lymphomas are B cell and 10% are T cell. And these are some various immunohistochemistry plots. You can see IHC is mandatory 
So as gastroenterologists, we must remember that patients will be, tissues will be subjected to many cuts and slices and so on and so forth. And therefore, we must provide adequate samples for these, uh, when these patients come to us for endoscopy and not just take two, three biopsies and send them away. So in general, although there are 50 plus subtypes, this is a Greek and a German uh, uh, study for GI lymphomas. You can see that the diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the commonest, which makes up about 50 percent of all GI lymphomas. Some of them are with malt, some are without malt. I discussed this before. Then you have malt lymphomas of the marginal zone. They they make up about 45, 48 percent. This is somewhat less in our country because we uh, diagnose them much later. And many of these are picked up during screening endoscopies, which go on in these countries. So they have many more mild lymphomas. Then we have T cell lymphomas, which make up a very small percentage of the GI lymphomas. So uh, we have looked at uh, the first five years at Tata Medical Center in Kolkata, looking just only at the large cell DLBCL lymphomas. There were uh, out of the 600 plus, 300 were uh, in the GI. Um, no, they were external. 123 were in the GI tract. So GI is the most common external site for gas for non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Within the GI, you can see again the distribution. Stomach is the commonest, 46 percent, followed by the small bowel, followed by the large bowel. And look at the staging. Yes, one third of the patients were in stage one and two, which are truly GI lymphomas, and two-thirds of the patients were stage three and four. That meant they were diagnosed at a much more advanced stage. And some uh, purists believe that these are not to be classified as GI lymphomas because they may be nodal, which has spread to the GI tract. So within the GI tract, gastric is the commonest, followed by large, <coughs> large and small bar. This is a very good paper, and I would recommend all of you to read this. This is a 10 years, 10 years experience from CMC Velour. And here you see that the large, diffuse large B cell, DLBCL is the commonest, followed by the multi, multi. And they had a fairly large number of Burkitt's type. But you can see that, you know, the Ipsid and mantle cell and uh, T cell, these are all very, very rare, even in India. So the common ones, if one were to look in the stomach, DL DLBCL was the commonest, followed by mild, followed by Burkitt's. In, in small intestine, DLBCL was again the commonest, followed by Burkitt's, mild. These are the T cell lymphomas, post transplant lymphomas, Ipsid. So they all make up a very small percentage. And similarly, in case of, case of colon. What, are the, what is the presentation of GI lymphoma? They are great masculinists with many non specific symptoms. <clears throat> this again is a very good paper for all of you to read. It is by Himan Kogli, where I think many of us have. Uh, Heard his talks, he's been a regular visitor to India, published recently in BMJ Open Gastroenterology. They looked at 16 cases, consecutive cases of GI lymphoma that they came to the center in Texas, Houston. And you can see the symptoms, dyspepsia, diarrhea, obstruction, pain, bleeding, pain, ascites, anemia. So, you know, they could present with any of these symptoms. And Endoscopically, there were polyps, there were ulcers, there was infiltration, there was mass, there was obstruction, just mucosal changes. So, in other words, clinical appearance, clinical symptoms, and endoscopic appearances are very, very wide in the case of GI lymphomas. <clears throat> but one of the consistent features which we have found in our country is that many of these patients have severe, moderate to severe malnutrition and cachexia. And patients who are malnourished and cachectic, 
have less complete response to treatment and have more complications and death during treatments, obviously because of their malnutrition. And their long-term survival also is markedly reduced. So the gastroenterologists who are diagnosing these patients should also look at their nutritional status and start nutritional therapy for them from day one instead of waiting for things to worsen and they are referred back to them for giving nutritional support. How do we make the diagnosis? Because of the very varied uh, symptomatology and appearance, the diagnosis is made incidentally. So be prepared. This is an old paper which we had done uh, many 20 years ago comparing gastric lymphoma and carcinoma in uh, 56 and 120 patients. And we found all kinds of appearances of the tumors. And the only consistent thing was the volcano crater. <coughs> this is it. It is a protruding tumor with ulceration in the center, like a volcano. This had very specific value in diagnosing lymphoma. Other than that, the overall sensitivity was very low for gross diagnosis and for biopsies, it was very high. So this is a different polyps. They're all lymphoma, lymphomatoid polyps. And uh, immunohistochemistry, this is a leukocyte common antigen is diffusely positive, suggesting it's a lymphoma. And the lymphoepithelial uh, lesion, which is quite characteristic of a mild lymphoma, is seen in this case. So, when you see abnormal mucosa, please take adequate biopsies. And if the lesion is looking submucosal, you can make that out using narrow band very easily. Sample the tissues by well technique so that you get some mucosa, adequate amount of submucosal tumors. How do you stage and prognosticate? Staging is important to plan appropriate therapy because very early lymphomas can be treated simply with antibiotics. And very early, in very early lymphomas, you can use EUS. So this is a mini probe that can be used if it is very superficial or a balloon assisted uh, <coughs> equendoscope. So this is a case of a Zollinger Ellison. You can see marked thickening of the mucosal layer due to parietal cell hyperplasia. It's not a tumor. You can see it's not black. Whereas this is a gastric lymphoma. You can see it is all restricted to the inner two layers. The muscularis propria is intact. So it's not spilled out. And these are some mini pro pictures. You can see very early uh, mucosal disease. Uh, which can be, you know, which helps to guide the treatment. <coughs> so the Lugano and the Paris classification systems are used to stage primary GI lymphomas nowadays. And very early tumors, stage one is tumors which are, you know, without any nodal involvement. So you have stage one mucosa and submucosa only involved. These are those tumors where one may consider eradicating Helicobacter pylori in the stomach or Campylobacter jejunae in the duodenum to achieve a response. However, when you have a diagnosis of lymphoma, PET scan would be an imaging of a, you know, <coughs> PET scan is uh, it gives a whole total picture of the nodal spread, marrow involvement, etc. We'll see some examples as we go by. Stage three and four are generally clubbed as stage four, and they are generally part of a diffuse, uh, you know, advanced lymphoma. The risk stratification also uses the IPI and its modification, the IPI and the NCCN IPI, etc. This helps to grade and prognosticate lymphomas. Coming to the management, antibiotic therapy is uh, recommended for very early mild lymphomas, which have not spread beyond the mucosa. And for all others, immunochemotherapy is the main treatment. So for immunochemotherapy, just a word about the B cells. 
which have which express the CD20 receptors <coughs> on the surface, and by blocking those CD20 with a monoclonal like rituximab, it activates various mechanisms, the you know, uh, macrophage, the NK cell, the DC, etc., uh, and causes destruction and causes severe uh, depression of the immunity. So, for gastroenterologists, please remember that. Uh, Rituximab is extensively used in management of both GI and non-nodal GI, non-GI non extranodal lymphomas. And we must remember that these patients, if they have old hepatitis B infection, which is fairly common in old people of India, and they can flare when because of extensive uh, suppression of the immunity. And so we need to identify these patients and give them prophylaxis if they are going in for a rituximab therapy. The general uh, principles of management includes for a very few patients one who are very elderly, who have a low burden and indolent type, you can wait and watch. <coughs> if the tumor is of mild type and early, one can try antibiotic therapy. Immunochemotherapy is generally used for almost 90% of all lymphomas. And it, it can be dose intensified in more aggressive forms. It may be dose intensified followed by transplantation in a few. Radiation is used for some uh, localized disease that is not responding well to immunochemotherapy. And other forms of immunotherapy and CART therapies are evolving. There are a lot of salvage therapies when first line treatments fail, and surgery is used to treat obstruction perforation and bleeding. Just a quick run through some of the rare lymphomas and I'll be finished. <coughs> this is an example of a, a mild lymphoma, but this is not in the stomach, but in the nasal mucosa where I was involved in the management. This patient incidentally had a helicobacter pylori. We, uh, he was initially treated inadequately for helicobacter. There was partial remission, but the tumor persisted and so did the H. pylori. Then four drug combination was given with eradication and complete regression. And the patient remained in remission for two years. And this is a nasal mild lymphoma, not a gastric, but probably he had some, uh, you know, uh, bacterial antigens that was triggering his uh, lymphoma. This is an example of a, a multiple lymphomatoid polyposis. This is a mantle cell type of lymphoma which presents as multiple polyps. <coughs> this patient had presented with bloody diarrhea. There were multiple polyps. You can see polyps in the stomach. There was a large tumor in the terminal ileum. There was a CD20 positive tumor. And this is a before treatment. And this is after treatment completely normalized. And the patient did was well for two years. But these lymphomas are generally known to relapse after two to three years. And sometimes the treatment is consolidated with the autologous bone marrow transplant. This is an enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma from uh, it was reported from Manipal. The patient had a usual presentation. 63 year old female who came with internal obstruction was found to have a tumor and underwent a resection. You can see that this is a CD3 positive tumor. It's a T cell lymphoma. And unfortunately, this patient uh, had post operative complications and succumbed to the disease. <clears throat> because these T cell lymphomas are extremely rare, there have been collaborative studies. This is a T cell project. Uh, across the world, many centers were participating. And they found that about 4% of all T cell lymphomas are in the enteropathy type, the, what we call the EATL type of DI uh, lymphomas, which are common in patients with celiac disease. So these were the symptoms. Just 4% were above 60. That means it was more in middle aged individuals. Most patients had these symptoms. All of them were advanced three or four. Bone marrow was involved in 
prognostic factors were very high. LDH was high and the survivals were very low. Three year survival, just about 30% of patients were able to survive for three years. And most of the patients were treated with chemotherapy with the anthracycline. These are some of the other rare types. This is from the Velour series. Patients who have had renal transplants on immunosuppressive, they go on to develop post-transplant lymphoma. These are some examples. Various sites, DLBCL as well as T cells. So the HIV infection again, immunosuppression, um, um, putting patients at risk of developing again stomach DLBCL as well as some. Um, other types. <clears throat> I think I've come to the end of my introduction and we'll begin the panel discussion. So the first question is uh, addressed to Prachi. Dr. Prachi Patel has introduced, is a professor of gastroenterology at GMH Mumbai. So can we suspect lymphomatous nature based on endoscopic appearance, and what about the biopsies? What are your views? What is your recommendation to all the listeners? Uh, so, uh, I think the short answer to the question is no. We cannot suspect lymphomatous nature of a neoplasm from its endoscopic appearance, and the slide that you are showing uh, demonstrates that uh, well. And uh, I'm probably repeating what you already said before, but uh, I just want to emphasize that there's a huge range of lesions that can represent lymphomas and there's no single diagnostic lesion. So at one end, we have these frank uh, tumor-like appearances, which could be polypoid or ulcerated or stenotic. And then there can be thick and cold, superficial ulcers, or even harmless gastritis like lesions, just some erythema or erosions. And endoscopy has also been reported to be normal in a small proportion of patients. Also, a lot of these patients are going to present with non-specific symptoms. So uh, the endoscopist doesn't really have a diagnosis of lymphoma at the back of his or her mind while doing the scopy. So most of them are not suspected to have a lymphoma, are being investigated for likely benign conditions. And I think uh, we can't just go by the endoscopic appearance. So a biopsy is uh, uh, absolutely a must uh, because there's no standard uh, endoscopic appearance. So uh, since histology is the gold standard, a structured biopsy protocol is quite important. And uh, two things to remember is that these are uh, tumors that can arise from deeper mucosa or submucosa. And also this can be multifocal, so sampling errors can happen. So I think uh, we need at least 8 to 10 deep biopsies from any abnormal looking areas. At the same time, especially for gastric lesions, we need to have biopsies from the normal areas also to look for H. pylori. So two biopsies from the antrum, two from the corpus, two from the fundus and also an RUT. Uh, it, it always helps to have the biopsies reviewed by a dedicated lymphoma pathologist. Uh, I think that's recommended by most guidelines. Now, would you send all biopsies to the lymphoma expert or you leave it to the pathology person reviewing it? So, I would leave it to the pathology because I don't know that I'm biopsying a lymphoma when I'm doing a biopsy. But if on pathology uh, there is a strong suspicion of a lymphoma, then it is good that a lymphoma expert sees it. So, what are the other uses in a, other than the diagnostic uh, endoscopy where endoscopy procedures can be used. So uh, the most important indication is diagnostic, where uh, apart from uh, taking biopsies, it's also important to document certain things like deeply ulcerated tumors or very bulky masses. Uh, as in some patients, they may predispose to some complications on therapy. Uh, EUS is uh, another uh, uh, place where endoscopy comes into play in the staging, especially for gastric lymphomas. So uh, typically a very thickened wall is seen in a lot of lymphomas. Uh, you can have thickening of more than 10 to 12 millimeters also. And there are some characteristic EUS features which have been described. So it can be multiple types like either a spreading type or infiltrating or a tumor kind of appearance. Uh, EUS has an importance in two things essentially uh, to prognosticate uh, the tumors and to uh, see who will respond. So uh, 
the deeper the uh, involvement of the wall layers in the stomach the less likelihood of responding to h pylori eradication in malt lymphomas and also if there are no lymph nodes seen uh, regional lymph nodes on eus then there is a high likelihood of eradication uh, to h pylori giving a good response so um, eus does not have any defined role in the follow up as of now uh, And there are a lot of patients who will come with obstructive tumors. So in these patients, uh, we can put feeding tubes um, to improve their nutritional status because chemotherapeutic regimens can also take a toll, and good nutrition is important. Uh, uh, just a word of caution about putting in metal stents uh, in these patients, both before taking biopsies and even after taking biopsies, because these are tumors that respond well to treatment. So we have to uh, be sure there's an MDT evaluation done before putting in stents. um some patients do present with obstructive jaundice because of nodal masses but again it's very rare that we need to step in and do an ERCP for these patients most of them will respond well to chemotherapy uh endoscopy uh we are frequently called upon when patients present with bleeding but it has a very limited role to play when patients present with complications like hematemesis yeah, so this is an example of a Large proximal gastric lymphoma causing uh, stenosis at the G junction and dysphagia. So this patient to be put a NG tube and then the patient has uh, chemotherapy and you can see there's a complete resolution of the tumor. So NG tube placement is very useful and NG tube also can be placed in many patients who have distal gastric tumors. <coughs> This is a patient who presented with obstructive jaundice. There is a Lymphoma in the periampullary region. That is the U.S. picture. There is a tumor in the inside the lumen as well as a tumor outside, causing biliary obstruction. And this was this patient actually underwent uh, biliary stenting and then received chemotherapy. Okay. Uh, so can I just also add a Caution about uh, using metal stents while doing a biliary stenting in these patients because again uh, a lot of these tumors would respond well. So it's always a good idea to have a multidisciplinary uh, team discussion and preferably put a plastic stent as compared to a metal stent. Okay, or a covered metal stent that can. Or a covered removed. metal stent which can be removed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next uh, question is to Dr. Rimpa. Dr. Rimpa is a senior consultant in radiation oncology uh, at Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, uh, and she is also the chief radiation oncologist in the lymphoma clinic. So Rimpa is covering for the radiologists as well. What is the staging uh, current standard for staging lymphomas, and is there any role to do bone marrow aspiration or bone marrow biopsy if a PET scan is done? Rimpa. So I think these are very important questions in context of uh, the beginning of um, diagnosis and treatment for any uh, any cancer and gastric. Uh, I mean, GI lymphomas are no different. And uh, the discussion for staging has been well set by discussions on um, upper GI endoscopy and EUS, which just got over. and i believe that uh, staging is important because that will dictate the treatment and the outcome of the patient so as for any treatment the first thing that a patient undergoes after an initial biopsy diagnosis uh, is when they come to clinic to us or any oncology center is a complete hemat and a biochemical profile for the usual reasons if there's anemia you correct it if there are derangements you correct it correct nutritional indicators of hemat and biochemistry if needed what is important for blood and biochemistry is a complete ldh and a beta 2 microglobulin for these patients because ldh values and beta 2 microglobulins are prognostic indicators and uh, predictors of outcome for uh, non hodgkin's lymphomas and uh, largely like dr mohandas mentioned in his presentation that in the correct scenario apart from upper gi endoscopy and eus and biopsies to prove the diagnosis pet is emerging in a very big way the 18 fluorodeoxyglucose pet is emerging in a very big way as kind of a one stop shop for staging investigations uh, although i believe that 
for our country, PET may not be available all over uh, the country. And uh, CT, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis with good quality contrast has been the standard of investigation for lymphomas. And uh, to mention in context of PET, the sensitivity of PET varies across the types of GI lymphomas that Dr. Professor Mohandas has elegantly described. Uh, to the extent that the sensitivity of picking up the lower grade GI lymphomas like extranodal marginal zone or gastric malt is only to the tune of about 71% for PET. However, if we are looking at DLBCLs which have infiltrated the gastrointestinal tract, the sensitivity is up to 100%. So that is a very small snag in terms of PET being used as the single investigation for lower grade tumors. However, most centers have now adopted PET and the staging has also been discussed is the Lugano or the Paris system of staging. They are very similar. The only advantage of the TNM classification, which is hardly ever used. So the Paris is mostly based on TNM and that just identifies the thickness of the gastric wall, which is a future responder of anti-helicobacter treatment for maltomas. So I thought I would mention that in the passing for the staging investigations. Apart from investigational staging as a clinician, it is very important to examine the oropharynx correctly because uh, there are situations where a finite percentage of patients may have involvement of the Waldeyer's ring in association with lymphomas involving stomach or other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. And as the picture, uh, as the slide is uh, shown by Dr. Mohandas, PET or metabolic investigations gives a global overview of extra gastrointestinal disease in terms of nodal involvement, pharyngeal involvement, or any other. And uh, the other staging thing is uh, our cytogenetic studies. Often uh, we as radiation oncologists have an important role to play in very limited stage maltomas or extranodal marginal zone lymphomas of the stomach. I keep mentioning stomach because stomach is the commonest site where we see these lymphomas in, as was shown by Dr. Mohandas in his presentation slides. And a T1118 translocation usually dictates the non-helicobacter uh, patients. So uh, helicobacter pylori staining, the standard stains of Genta, Wadden, Stari, et cetera, or even serology in about 10% of patients with helicobacter infections could be a start or most often is a part of the staging workup to have a bearing on the treatment because often for very early stage helicobacter associated maltomas, radiation oncologists would say that give a trial of anti-helicobacter and majority of the patients would clear out and you don't have to treat these patients with ionizing radiation. I think that's the standard approach. Now, coming to the second pertinent question of bone marrow investigation, I would just cover that by saying that, again, for the low-grade tumors like extranodal marginal zone and mall tumors, which may not be FDG avid, if there is a suspicion of advanced disease, please go ahead with the marrow biopsy. For DLBCLs, PET is gradually replacing the use of investigation like the bone marrow biopsy, and it is a very sensitive investigation to pick up bone marrow disease. I think if there's anything else, Dr. Mohandas, that uh, needs you, attention. You, we'll uh, move on. If there are other questions, we, you know, we'll get them up at the end. So the next question is to Dr. Professor Navin Khatri, who is a um, medical oncologist, and uh, he heads the bone marrow transplant program at GMS Mumbai. So what are the importance of prognostication of patients and uh, the role of uh, MDT in improving outcomes? You know, I showed in the beginning the results of survival results of lymphomas in India are pretty bad. So will MDTs help? And nowadays you have EMDTs. You have experts all over the country or world who can participate. Very often we reach out to Randana Adwani in Stanford she has been extremely supportive to many of us. So, uh, what are your views on that? Um, thank you, sir. Firstly, you know, thank you for giving such a simplistic overview of a group of disorders which is complex to even hemato-oncologists like us. 
um it it was a phenomenal lecture sir very simple um, very nice now coming to that question of prognostication um you know in lymphoma the simplest has been the international prognostic index which was conceptualized way back in 1993 1994 and it just has five clinical factors age ldh uh, staging um and then the extranodal site involvement and um, the um, ldh now in this five with this five factors we were able to prognosticate however the problem ar arose when rituximab came into the treatment armamentarium and with that the overall survival of all lymphomas started improving significantly so then this lost its significance and came the revised ipi where revised ipi meant that in the rituximab era the the stratification slightly changed but those five factors remain as the prognostic factors now the ncc and ipi is a modification of that because age in the ipi was 60 and above now we all know that lymphomas um have different prognostication according to age 40 to an age 75 or 80 so the ncn ipi actually further discriminates with the age and you have four groups 40 60 60 to 75 and above 75 and it also further stratifies the ldh in the ipi it was broad it was only upper limit of normal but in the ncn ipi it was further stratified to more than three times the normal or less than three times with this the discrimination has improved and one now you will see that with the ncn ipi you are able to discriminate the best group versus the poorest group but this is also not adequate because even with the nccn ipi most patients in the worst group also have survival of around 50% which is actually not true because it's not like taking into account the molecular um, stratification so right now in a natural ncn ipi is probably the best discriminator but more needs to be done by adding the molecular signatures as you have um suggested uh, 1118 and 314 and so forth so on so forth now as far as mdt is concerned i think in every um disease every <laughs> cancer mdt forms a backbone of treatment strategy in our hospital the tata hospital the mdt for lymphoma as sir you would know started in 1987 88 with dr admani and dr dinshaw and that has led to um i wouldn't say um, that you know i would not have the hard fact of how the survival outcomes would have improved but it certainly helps in managing patients because you have a radiation oncologist a medical oncologist a pathologist and for gi lymphomas a gastroenterologist who will then sit and decide upon the treatment strategy lymphomas are heterogeneous what may appear like a diffuse large b cell may actually be a man, um, a malt lymphoma or a mantle cell depending on how good a lymphoma expert is there in pathology so this certainly helps and that i think most of us will agree it helps so loving your next uh, question is yeah, briefly tell us about the principles you know employed in treating uh, managing gi lymphomas and how you know the different subtypes basic similar simple differences because we don't have too much of time so in if you could do that so prachi and rimpa have already discussed about the nutritional aspects so i'm not going to go to that i would straight away come to how do you treat one versus the other so the easiest i think for the gastroenterologists will be maltomas because the gastric maltomas the best treatment is to give the h pylori treatment and then wait and watch they are low grade lymphomas even if you don't do anything for some time it's not going to cause a major problem the important is the diffuse large b cell lymphoma and that has to be treated just like a diffuse large b cell of the lymph nodes so you give 6 to 8 cycles of rituximab uh, based chemo uh, rituximab based chemotherapy and the standard is chop many of uh afas would have heard that 
that is the standard treatment with rituximab. Now, what is very important is you need to check for chronic hepatitis B before starting rituximab, as you have just mentioned earlier, because that will lead to the flare of hepatitis B. Now, for mantle cell lymphoma, again, it's rituximab based with um, addition of cytolabine, which is a very important drug for mantle cell lymphoma. Ipsit is predominantly, again, antibiotics, tetracycline or metronidazole for a few months. And if it doesn't subside, then, of course, chemotherapy. The worst is the entropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma. We certainly have a long way to go to have a good treatment for that. Presently, CHOP seems to be the drug um, regimen, but there is a lot more to do for that group of lymphomas. So has any of the panel members, uh, anybody has seen more than five MLPs or uh, T-cells in their career? Just, just to get an idea how common this disease is. Rimpa? So, I haven't seen more than five EATLs. Naveen? So since, um, you know, we have a huge tertiary center, I yeah. think I, over the last 10 years, I've seen certainly more than five. Okay. Both. But again, as as we know, it's rare, and the prognosis is very poor for the EATLs. Uh, regarding the MLPs, would you consolidate chemotherapy with transplant? Because these are mantle cells and uh, are always prone to relapse within a few years. So it depends on the age and the performance status. If the, if the patient is of a younger age, less than 60, and with good performance status, there is enough evidence uh, for mantle cell lymphoma that uh, doing transplant in first remission probably has the best outcomes. So yes, you know, these are the mantles and lymphoma patients who probably should undergo transplant in the first remission. The, there is an em emerging view also that in patients with celiac disease, if you catch the very early stage of ETL, you can subject them to transplants, autologous. Do you have any uh, knowledge about it? I, yes, sir. The, the only problem with the EATLs is, you know, that, you know, by the time he, the patient presents, the patient already has a significant history of malabsorption with, um, uh, you know, with the, the performance status not being great. Having said that, if you have young patients with good performance status, one can certainly uh, take these patients for auto autologous transplant but the T cell lymphomas don't do as well as the B cell, even with auto transplants. So the prognosis will certainly be more guarded than the B cell. Mantle cell is a B cell. This is a T cell lymphoma. Thank you, Navin. Uh, we come back to Rimpa. Rimpa, what about the role of radiation therapy in the management of GI lymphomas? Yes, so uh, like we saw that uh, the GI lymphomas are a, a very heterogeneous group involving a number of diagnoses. And uh, as for radiation oncology for any indication, the treatment can either be with a curative intent or it can be a palliative intent. And palliation can be endoscopic procedures, it can be palliative chemotherapy, or palliative radiation mostly for obstruction because we don't usually use a lot of radiotherapy for uh, uh, for uh, active bleeds for lymphomas, although there is a niche indication there. So the palliation is a different ballgame. Now, coming to the curative aspect, radiation can either be used alone for very niche indications like very early stage, stage one and stage two extranodal marginal zone lymphomas of the stomach or gastric or intestinal maltomas or it can be integrated with combined chemoimmunotherapy, mostly for early stage bulky disease, DLBCLs. Because the moment there is advanced stage in DLBCL, although there is a role of radiation therapy for improving prognosis-free interval, it doesn't impact OS. So to have a very simple algorithm, radiation therapy for GI lymphomas, curative, palliative. Palliative for palliation of symptoms, Curative as single modality for early stage low grades, 
and as a part of combined modality treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphomas of the GI tract of limited stage. You know, uh, since more, many patients with lymphomas will get cured and will have a very long life, what about the long-term side effects of radiation therapy to the GI tract? Do you want to just say a little bit? Oh, of that? course. So the advantage of being a lymphoma radiation oncologist is that lymphomas are exquisitely sensitive to radiation therapy and therefore the doses required for eradication or local control that impacts the overall survival is less. So you know, sir, that for lymphomas of the lower grade like maltomas, a dose of 25 to 30 gray is more than enough to achieve a 90 to 100 percent overall survival in these patients and so is it for extranodal. The only problems uh, with using low dose would be slight anorexia, nausea, vomiting, these are acute effects which can be handled on outpatient basis with supportive care. Slightly higher doses are used for DLBCLs or in certain very selected cases of salvage for refractory disease. There we could have some problems like telangiectasia, GI bleeds, subacute obstructions. But if handled well, I mean, if organ tolerance or renal tolerance is well respected, the GI and the kidney, which is often um, the organ of risk in the, in the abdominal radiation, is well handled. So there's nothing to fear with good use of radiation oncology. Thank you. Um, Dr. Navin uh, or Prachi, what would be the optimal follow-ups? Because uh, these are patients who achieve complete response a large majority will achieve complete response and then, you know, you are wanting to look for relapses that may happen over a period of time. So would you repeat endoscopies, imaging, uh, how, do, how do you follow up these patients? Uh, so uh, endoscopy uh, uh, probably has a definite role in the gastric lymphomas. Uh, so uh, two situations, one is malt lymphomas uh, where uh, we will con confirm the eradication and this scopy will be done at least six to eight weeks after the patient uh, has started on anti-H pylori treatment. And we have to be sure that the patient has been off PPIs for two weeks and off antibiotics for uh, about four weeks. And again, a sim similar meticulous biopsy protocol where we sample all possible abnormal areas is important. And uh, the endoscopy is repeated three monthly in patients with uh, malt lymphomas of the stomach until the patient has a complete response. Uh, and this has to be documented on two consecutive scopies, either a complete response or a minimal residual disease. And that there are uh, standard pathological definitions for both. And once the patient does have a response, then an endoscopy six monthly, at least for the first two years, and then annually. Uh, in patients with uh, DLBCLs of the stomach, uh, an endoscopy can be done six monthly, again, for the first two years, and then annually thereafter. Uh, an important thing is that patients with malt lymphomas also are at an increased risk of uh, adenocarcinomas of the stomach, almost a five to six fold increased risk. So while doing follow-up scopies, one should also be looking for early gastric cancer-like lesions. But uh, again, we know that we need to do surveillance, but for how long, that is something that's not really definite. Uh, I don't think there are any guidelines for surveillance of patients who have uh, endoscopic surveillance of patients who have either small intestinal or large intestinal lymphomas. Naveen, do you have anything to add? No, no. Okay. So this, I think, is my last question for the panel for want of time. And that is uh, once the tumor relapses or sometimes in a small percentage in whom there is no complete remission, there are a lot of salvage therapies which have evolved in the last decade. So now can you tell us something about that and also the role of uh, BMT checkpoint inhibition as well as CART therapy? Briefly, what a so, gastroenterologist yeah. should know. So just broadly, you know, all the salvage therapy is probably best for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma because they are aggressive and T-cell lymphoma. For maltoma, you really don't need such intensive salvage therapies because they still do well, even with gentle treatments. Now for DLBCL, BMT is the... It's one o'clock. Hello? No, no, carry on, carry on. So the BMT is the uh, best salvage therapy 
after giving some chemotherapy for those who relapse after a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Checkpoint inhibition in diffuse large B cell lymphoma is not as good as in um, Hodgkin lymphoma and some other lymphomas. So it can be used, but that's not the best treatment. CAR T cells certain, certainly in those who fail after transplant because there is um, emerging data that CAR T cell is good for um, diffuse large B cell lymphomas. And what CAR T cells means is that you develop your own T cells which are targeting those B cells which have the cancer. Now for maltomas, you know, one can use salvage therapies like radiation and even rituximab based if they fail to antibiotics. So basically maltomas are low grade, so the intensity is low grade. B cell, DLB cell is aggressive, T cell is aggressive, so your salvage therapy also has to be aggressive, provided the patient is fit to undergo the salvage therapy. Can you just uh, add a very brief comment on the cost of therapy of patient? Because that's something that we don't bother about. We start our patients on treatment and halfway down the line, they give up treatment. And that's one of the reasons why we have poor outcomes. Yes, sir. So thank you. The, the cost and the length of treatment that doctors should be telling their patients up front. So, um... Initial upfront therapy for uh, aggressive lymphomas like DLBCL is the treatment is R-CHOP, six to eight cycles. And that usually takes around um, three to 3.5 lakhs because the most uh, expensive drug in that is rituximab, which is around 28 to 30,000 per cycle. When they relapse, then transplant comes into the armamentarium after some salvage chemotherapy and transplant could be anywhere from a government hospital like Ames to around two to three lakhs to our hospital and your hospital to around five to six lakhs just for transplant. As far as CAR T cell is concerned, well, no center in India has started. We will certainly start maybe in the next one year. We don't know what the cost will be, but it will certainly be in lakhs. So that's, um, you know, um, again, out of the reach of most of the patients. Checkpoint inhibitors, again, it's expensive right now, and it could be anything between five to eight lakhs for uh, at least three to six months. What we need to remember is that checkpoint inhibitors may have to be given till progression. And I don't think any um, section of our society except the ultra rich who can continuously take the checkpoint inhibitors till progression. So that again, only in a clinical trial, you'll be able to get patients. Okay, thank you, Navin. So to summarize today's uh, discussions, I would like to say that GI yeah, lymphomas are not uncommon, uh, provided we look for it, and which means that there is a adequate biopsy is necessary. The GI lymphomas present in various ways and they masquerade, and therefore, there is no real way of knowing when you first see the patient or first do the endoscopy as to this is a lymphoma and therefore taking multiple adequate biopsies which uh, Prachi had explained so well should be carried out. Uh, the tissues must go for immunohistochemistry and I would, you know, most medical colleges are still, uh, we find reports not having IHCs. Sometimes the tumors are reported as uh, poorly differentiated carcinoma, and then we uh, re-biopsy and uh, do IHC and find it's a lymphoma. So those, those kind of things can be avoided if at the initial go itself. Simple immunohistochemistry, which can be carried out everywhere, is done. I mentioned about the malnutrition and cachexia being a poor uh, prognostic factor, and a lot of GI pa lymphoma patients have it. And that should be addressed by the gastroenterologist from the very beginning. For high-grade lymphomas, PET-CD is the one-stop staging. For low-grade, of course, the sensitivity of PET-CD comes down. Therefore, it's a good idea to wait for the biopsy, have the biopsy report come, and then order the appropriate scan. Because I find that sometimes neuroendocrine tumors, again, so patients get multiple CT scans, MRI scans, when actually for neuroendocrine, they need a hynecdota scan. For a high-grade lymphoma, you need a PET scan. 
for a rectal cancer, it may be just a MR pelvis with a CT scan of the chest and the upper abdomen. So instead of duplicating and wasting the money of the patients, one should wait for the biopsy report before the appropriate scanning is performed. Early mild lymphomas can be cured by antibiotics, and so uh, this is entirely within the purview of the gastroenterology. Uh, you know, you need to look at when you find small lesions, you need to biopsy them, confirm that they are early mild lymphomas, and then they can be treated with antibiotics. Immunochemotherapy forms the the main workhorse against treatment of GI lymphomas. And radiotherapy and surgery are needed in a select group of patients. And even if the patients uh, relapse, uh, there is a large set of patients who relapse who can be salvaged. Many of them can be even cured by other treatments that we have discussed during this panel. I have included some references here. These are the first is uh, Professor Kugli's group's uh, paper in DMJ Open. This is an open access. The patterns of GI lymphomas from Velo. And this is, of course, the national management of lymphoma in the expert group. And this is very appropriate. In addition, if you want, there are, of course, hundreds of guidelines available from NCCM and onwards. But I find the ESMO which is the European Society of Medical Oncology to be the most practical for a country like ours. And they have various guidelines, including pocket guidelines are there. So one could, uh, you know, refer to that. So now we can open the meeting for questions and answers. I'll close my presentation so that I can see what other what is happening. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mohandas. I think it has been a superb and a masterly overview in a very limited period of time of the entire gamut of uh, presentations and problems that one faces with uh, GI lymphomas. And um, you as well as the panel have done, um, have really been able to give a very concise and a, uh, overview. Uh, there have been a lot of questions on the chat box, about 35, 40 questions have already come in. And uh, maybe we can use the next uh, 20 minutes or so to cover some of these questions. Uh, Dr. Simna from Trivandrum wants to know what is exactly the difference between the Lugano and the modified Paris staging for primary GI lymphomas and uh, how do we use them? So maybe somebody. Can I take this? Yeah. Yes, so, Naveen. In, in in practical sense, no one uses the TNM staging for lymphoma. It's the Lugano staging, which has been um, simplified from the previous staging of Ann Arbor and their modification. So the Lugano staging is very simple and it tells you whether it's localized to the organ for extranodal, whether the lymph nodes local regionally have been involved or whether it has spread to other extranodal regions which are distant. And that's the way that's probably the easiest to, way to stage because the treatment actually will only depend whether it's localized or it's distant, you know, whether, whether it's widespread. So the TNM staging may be uh, more important in solid cancers, not in hematolymphoid cancers as per se. Until unless you're looking at the endoscopic ultrasound and then looking at the mucosal and submucosal involvement, which may have some prognostic um, uh, relevance, but to be honest, in the broad base, it probably will not make too much of a difference. And the Paris modification and the Paris staging, how does it add to the Lugano? So that's that's what it is. Sir. The Paris staging is the TNM, the tumor size, yeah. the node and the metastasis, right. which is predominantly for solid tumor cancers. Um, it doesn't have significant relevance in um, lymphomas per se. Right. So in order to um, not confuse the students, of uh, gastroenterology in this um, uh, meeting, I think Lugano staging is very simple. That's probably the best to use. And even our students, we recommend them to use this. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Bhavesh from Lucknow wants to know why B-cell uh, lymphomas are so much more commoner than the T-cell lymphomas. 90% versus 10% what you had said. So any thoughts on that? Sir is the epidemiologist. Sir, could you answer that question? <laughs> 
I don't know. Many people. <coughs> Probably the reason uh, nobody is, if you apply Vogel's science hypothesis, then one would think that there are more B cells in the body than there are T cells. Uh, that could be one, but you know, there is something called p 2 paradox. Elephants and whales don't get cancer, although they have millions of more cells than other animals. So if you assume that the number of cells, you know, large animals get cancer, small animals don't get that many cancers. And the animals that live very long get more cancers as compared to those who live because these mutations happening in the stem cells uh, are happening at random. So I, I have no idea as to how this is more common, but uh, in terms of numbers, the load of these cells and right. so, you know, yeah, it's one of those things that it is just the way we can have uh, explanations or offer possibilities, but it's very difficult to be very sure on these things. Um, I think uh, in continuation with this, I think there's a question on uh, the so-called Indian paradox that you have a, such a lot of H. pylori infection prevalent in this country, but compared to that gastric cancer, gastric lymphoma is not all that common. So uh, again, uh, any thoughts on uh, why this is so? So, uh, the, the, it started off as the African paradox and then it ended up as Indian paradox. Uh, the original H. pylori gastric cancer was mentioned as the African paradox because there also there's a lot of H. pylori but very little gastric cancer. There are several reasons. One of them is that the average life expectancy, the COVID paradox also it is the same. The average life expectancy is less. We have Italy has 26 percent of the population above 60 years of age. India has just 10 percent. If COVID is killing all people, of our, you know, the old people, obviously more will die there than in a young country. So between in India also, if you see Uttar Pradesh and Kerala, in my paper, I've shown very clearly the age difference of the mm. pyramid. Uh, in Kerala, there are many more old people, so more cancer is there. So that is one of the things. Secondly, the lot of low-grade lymphoma are not diagnosed because endoscopists are not taking adequate biopsies. Uh, typically, you go to a busy medical college hospital, you will see endoscopies being done in two minutes, three minutes. Um, that is the time taken. I'm being very critical on the national meeting because that's not the way to go. Uh, if you go Japan, each endoscopy takes 40 to 45 minutes. They wash every nook and corner and then they take biopsy. So, you diagnosed lesions earlier. Uh, I showed you that two thirds of all the lymphomas are very advanced, uh, which is not the case of God. So, those things are all contributing to the survival, the incidence, etc. Uh, in addition right. to this, there is also a very interesting theory which is about the presence of elements in the GI tract. The elements modulate the T lymphocyte uh, responses, immune responses. And there have been very elegant studies done in mice, published in nature. Mice with H. pylori infection, if they are also exposed to elements, they get less elements because the progression of the is that the gastritis, gastric dysplasia, the pathway is completely altered if the gut T cells are you know, being modulated by the elements. Yeah. And urbanization is something that causes elements to disappear from the gut, associated mm -hmm. with disease, Crohn's disease, a uh, number of other diseases also seem to be increasing as elements are disappearing from the gut. Uh, Deco Bohundas, your voice is not coming very clear. I think, uh, uh, are you too close to your mic or something? Some uh, distance. Any, I think this is a long topic that can uh, will probably merit separate discussion also. So I think we can probably move to some of the other more practical uh, questions. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Prachi mentioned clearly about how to take biopsies in people with suspected lymphoma. On the same, at the same time, you did mention that it is actually endoscopically not possible to be sure that there is going to be a lymphoma. So, in practice, what you're suggesting is that in every suspected cancer or lesion that appears malignant, you must take about eight to ten pieces, 
and yes. also sample the corpus, the body and the fundus, RUT, all that in every patient with the, say, a gastric um, lesion that looks so, could be a uh, cancer. Yeah, so uh, this is what is recommended in every patient. But unfortunately, we don't really know who is going to have a strong suspicion of uh, turning out to be a lymphoma. So typically what happens is that these protocols are followed up often at the second endoscopy. So someone comes with a biopsy suspicious of a lymphoma sent for a repeat scopy and then you have the, uh, then you can probably, you know, do a very detailed staging and do a detailed biopsies and all that. But very, very often the index scopy is, you know, you will approach it like you would approach any other patient with gastritis. So this kind of a thing is frequently at the second scopy and not really at the index scopy. Yeah. See, uh, I just want to add that even for gastric adenocarcinoma, you must request the pathologist to look for features of helicobacter in the yeah. resected yeah. specimen margins. And you, you must eradicate it to prevent relapse. Uh, there, is, there are randomized trials, meta-analysis showing that H. pylori eradication reduces gastric cancer. And now gastric cancer has become the fourth leading cancer in India. So it mm -hmm. is not rare anymore because in the Indians have become older and are now getting, you know, the long effects of gastric cancer. Right. I mean, if it is so, if the change in epidemiology of a gastric cancer in our country was the last uh, 20 or 30 years, and now gastric cancer being the first important uh, uh, cancer, uh, uh, GI cancer, then this question also becomes very relevant, which uh, the, we discussed just now that H. pylori and gastric cancer, is it still a paradox? Uh, so I think uh, rather than closing the story here that is a paradox, I think we should re keep our mind open and thoughts open that uh, we may not be right uh, what we've been thinking. There may be a new thoughts there and, uh, and probably we require more, we more science. More, more information. I mean, this yeah. is a uh, uh, thing under construction. It's not a complete picture as yet. So, so from taking from one of the old Western movies, I like to say that the only good H. pylori is a dead H. pylori. <laughs> right. Okay, moving on with some of the other questions. I think um, uh, you mentioned about rituximab and hepatitis B um, uh, preemptive treatment may be needed. So, Dr. S. K. Sharma from New Delhi wants to know if a person, how often is tuberculosis and or HBV seen in these people with GI lymphoma? And if so, what should be the optimum duration of antiviral therapy or anti-tuberculous therapy given before you start chemotherapy for lymphoma? You are muted, Dr. Naveen. Could you unmute and... Naveen, yeah, that's better. So not only for GI lymphoma, it should... It... The answer is actually, the question is for any lymphoma. Now, hepatitis B is prevalent in our country and the gastroenterologist will know more than me But what is the incidence of hepatitis B, the chronic hepatitis B. So for those who are having lymphoma and need rituximab, they must get the HB core IgG done and the other anti-HBSCG and HBSCG done. And if there is chronic hepatitis B, then they must be on an antiviral for at least two to three weeks uh, before they can be given rituximab, but they can be given other parts of the chemotherapy because they will probably not have a major um, role to play as far as flare is concerned. So that's uh, for the rituximab. For tuberculosis, unfortunately, again, the incidence of TB um, in India and the, uh, the, and the endemicity of TB, it is not easy to... Um, tell you exactly what you would do, but um, if you have TB, which is have, which is um, occurring together with lymphoma, I don't know whether that happens usually. Some people would have already had tuberculosis and then they may have lymphoma or after you start the treatment for lymphoma, then you develop TB. So basically there, I don't think there's any major issue regarding starting the ATT as well as the chemotherapy for um, um, lymphoma. You only would need to look at the drug interactions because some of the drugs may be underdosed and some may be overdosed. Then I'm not sure that you know one would really wait till you start treating tuberculosis because lymphoma is also as aggressive as tuberculosis. It is predominantly for rituximab that we need to give 
few weeks of antiviral before you give the rituximab. Right. So I, I just can add a bit. Uh, when we started here in Kolkata, we were not routinely screening all our patients for core, total core antibody. And we had uh, four patients who had fulminant hepatitis flares. They were all HBSAG negative, and the initial screen is, you know, a screen for uh, HBSAG, anti-HCV, and HIV. So they were all negative, and these patients, four flares, two patients died of fulminant hemophilia. Uh, since then, I'm going by the world guidelines. Uh, we started now doing routinely core antibodies, total core antibodies for all our patients. And uh, let me tell you, 13% of the patients who come to my hospital are core antibody positive. So the prevalence, population prevalence of core antibody positivity is very high. Cancer patients are all old people. They are not demonized. Uh, you know, they are all pre-vaccine uh, era patients. And so they are all at risk. And so we have to screen all, all patients who are undergoing long chemotherapies, uh, immunosuppressive yeah. therapies for so all all core antibody positive patients are advised uh, um, uh, preemptive antiviral therapy if they are getting highly immunosuppressive yes, therapy took, uh, yes. so it's is also plan. used in many non oncology settings like it is used in i think arthritis and some ophthalmology yeah. situations yeah. so many places so you know you will have patients who may flare and okay so keep a watch Right, so that is uh, uh, useful information. Uh, Dr. Shankar Barai from Nepal wanted to know what should be the duration of antibiotic treatment for a patient with early IPSID? So, IPSID is really, really rare. I think very, very few, even the biggest series show like three to four patients seen over a period of 10 years. But what is really Recommended is, uh, I think, an antibiotic combination, tetracyclines with metronidazole, and you need to give it long term, three to six months. And I think if there's no response at the end of six months, then maybe the medical oncologist would consider chemotherapy. Uh, if I can have a word out here. So yeah. in our clinic, at Celia Clinic, we have about uh, 12 patients with IPSID following. And very interesting, two observations. One, that uh, number of patients who received renal transplantation <coughs> And they, they are referred to us as a chronic diarrhea, and we find uh, some of them have a uh, IPSID. So my uh, question was, uh, uh, I planned the question to you also that uh, uh, the post-transplant uh, uh, lymphoproid disorder, the PTLD, and IPSID. So are the two different things? Are the spectrum of uh, two different spectrum? That post-transplant, uh, especially renal transplant, and we see patients at the stage when they have a uh, IPSID stage, and they will describe the PTLD. So are the same spectrum. For IPSID, they need to be producing alpha heavy chains. So how, do we, how do we confirm that? We, do, we don't have uh, electrophoresis. Electrophoresis. Uh, yeah. So yeah. only if then if that is present, you would call it IPSID. Otherwise, it would be uh, one of the other B lymphomas of the. So alpha be here in the jugal fluid, not in the bloodstream. So, so sir. In the general, it is a little higher, but you can do it in the blood also. Hmm. So, you know, the PTLD classically are EBV driven. So, you know, the post-transplant lymphomas, whether it's to solid organ or to the bone marrow transplant, are EBV driven. So, if you do the blood EBV PCR, mostly you will get high loads of EBV PCR. It does not have any prognostic connotation, but it may help. The IPSID is basically the alpha chain um, uh, disease where, you know, as Dr. Mohandas has already said. So, you know, the treatment may also be a bit different between the two. And uh, the IPSID may respond to the chemo uh, to antibiotics. The PTLD will not respond to the antibiotics because it is that it has got nothing to do with Campylobacter jejuni or any of the other microorganisms. It's an EBV driven lymphoma. Right. Okay. Um, I think continuing with the, the, there's a lot of interest in IPSID because people, at least a gastroenterologist, read a fair bit about IPSID. So Dr. Gautam from Udupi wants to know, I mean, this appears to be uh, a slightly hypothetical situation, that if a person has a diagnosis of IPSID in the small bowel, as well as H. pylori is present, uh, can this be, the, can the IPSID be related to H. pylori and can this patient be 
treated only with H pi anti H pylori therapy? So uh, this is, uh, I think uh, it's an anecdotal uh, kind of a question. So uh, uh, generally, if there's any lymphoma with H. pylori positivity in the stomach, there's definitely no harm in uh, doing an H. pylori eradication therapy. However, with a proven IPSID, uh, I think it would be judicious to also give the standard antibiotic treatment for IPSID because if the patients do not respond, they may have to move on to chemotherapy. Okay. So I, I presented a nasopharyngeal uh, lymphoma that responded to H. pylori therapy. Actually, if you see the literature, there are lots of mild lymphomas that other sites, salivary gland, lacrimal gland, uh, and there are many anecdotal uh, cases where eradicating H. pylori has caused permanent depression. In fact, that was the reason why that particular case we chose to eradicate H. pylori, and we also were surprised. We don't know if there is some other infection which was sitting there driving that, and the same antibiotics worked on that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, infection, and therefore, or it is a remote control by H. pylori all the way from the stomach to the nose or to the lacrimal gland and so on and so forth. Right. In the oral cavity, he had lots of papers on it. So there could be H. pylori in other places. But I mean, still, this link is well established, and the response also established. It may be put, uh, prudent to do what Prachi has suggested that uh, if you have a proven right. infant, so treat for that as well as for H. pylori. All right. So I think, uh, in relation to your in the comment on HBV, Dr. Naveen, uh, Dr. Uh, Amit Yel Sangikar from Bangalore wants to, uh, and, uh, the, his question is that with the increasing use of azathioprine in inflammatory bowel disease, reports of lymphoma in the colon are also increasing. Can this be prevented and is there a role for EBV testing before initiating thiopurine treatment? Um, it's a difficult question. You know, there are lots of immune suppressive drugs used for various diseases, and many of them may be um, associated with increased risk of cancer. Having said that, you, you wouldn't do an EBV PCR to look for whether there is an EBV reactivation before doing giving treatment, because you know, if you look at um, number of patients who receive, say, azathioprine, and the number of patients who then develop a T cell lymphoma the percentage is not significant. What we need to understand is that we need to keep a close watch. And if there are some vague symptoms also which develop, one needs to identify the cause of it and then diagnose it and then treat it. But I don't think you can you know, do an EBV PCR for all patients who will go to infliximab or to do that because there are many more immune suppressive drugs which are coming on. And they'll be used for various malignant and non-malignant disorders. Uh, so right. We are coming to end of our time now. So right. it's almost reaching 1.30. Uh, can I ask one question? And it's a question. Uh, uh, is it is a relevant uh, from the country perspective that especially those maltomas and we are treating H. pylori, the eradication rate of H. pylori is uh, to be confirmed. Now, the drug which we use in our country is uh, clithromycin. Uh, Emoxily and the PPI. PPI is not a problem. Uh, Emoxicillin is not a problem. But the problem is now with the uh, clithromycin. Clithromycin resistance is increasing. And there are pockets in our country where 40% of uh, people are resistant to, or H. pylori resistant to clithromycin. Therefore, writing a prescription that I'll give two weeks of antibiotics and PPI, and, and think in mind that uh, we have treated H. pylori in Maltona is not confirmed. Uh, the, we need to confirm the H. pylori eradication at end of treatment. And even my own experience, we're treating three patients uh, simultaneously. And in two, we, even after two courses of uh, anti H. pylori treatment, uh, there's still there is H. pylori. And after one course of uh, antibiotic, the lesion improved, but the lesion again started worsening. So for all of us to understand, writing prescription of uh, H. pylori in our country uh, is not enough. We need to really confirm that we have uh, eradicated uh, effectively this. And we will have our own guidelines coming up, uh, which is led by Dr. Uh, S.P. Singh, 
that Indian guidelines on SPLRI. And there we flag a very important issue of uh, emerging uh, clarithromycin resistance. And we have to have an alternative strategy. And one good thing, uh, I think all of us uh, we want to say that now bismuth is now getting available in our country. So we might have to use bismuth-based uh, uh, therapy in many patients with uh, SPLRI. And my last question to uh, uh, maybe uh, the panelists, that if you have a myeloma and you have eradicated SPLRI and the lesion have regressed, what is the protocol for follow-up of uh, these individuals? And this question has come from Hari Prasad from uh, Indore. Yeah, I think Dr. S.K. Mishra and even Dr. Jayanti from Chennai have the same question. So I think it does need the comment from the panel. Prachi, you want to take that? Post eradication, uh, I think, so eradication has to be confirmed on two consecutive endoscopy and biopsies done three months apart. And following that, six monthly endoscopies for the first two to three years, followed by annual endoscopies. And again, to look not just for a malt recurrence, but also to look for early gastric cancer like lesions. And this is a very important point that uh, many people believe that uh, maltoma once treated, treated forever. So all these patients have to be kept into surveillance program and yeah. very frequent surveillance. Yeah. I think I just can't resist this last question from Professor Jang Delavri in Chandigarh. He also wants to know why gastric lymphomas is so common, although stomach does not have many lymphocytes. So, getting a lot of philosophical questions, Dr. Mohandas. Why, why cancers here? Why cancers there? Yeah, so, so, if you see the new treatment in cancer is immunotherapy. You know, the, the big thing in the cancer therapy is immunotherapy in the last few years. And if you see the GI tract, the biggest immune protecting mechanism lies anywhere, just from duodenum all the way down. The stomach, because of its own functions, have very little, you know, lymphoid tissue. So it is a little less protected as compared to small bowel. You don't see cancer. They are the big, if you take in terms of surface area of the mucosa, small bowel mucosa is so big. And it has the least amount of cancer, but it has it is full of immunotherapy that's the full of payers, patches, and lymphoids are on. So they don't really get malignancy, they don't develop so easily in those I think that's the reason. Okay. So keep H okay. away and wonderful discussion. I think Govind I'll have a Lee hand over to you now. I think you're a very I think we have about 55 odd questions still remaining from the panel, which uh, I think we'll follow the usual practice, maybe Dr. Mohandas, of sending the unanswered questions, about 30, 35 of them to you, and maybe you or some of the panel could help out. And if these answers that you provide will be then put up on the website along with the recording of this session for the participants to look at the answers to their questions. Okay, and with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Makaria. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for a wonderful talk. And uh, I think uh, this is more than what we expected. Uh, all the important point uh, re regarding you know, when to suspect, uh, how to achieve diagnosis. A very important point raised that uh, you must take multiple biopsies while you do, while you suspect uh, uh, lymphoma. And again, do all the stage, pro st proper staging of treatment. Again, we know that many lymphoma are effective therapy and uh, one can treat. And one last word that uh, SPLRI. Please confirm if you eradicate SPLRI, especially in those lymphomas. And all these patients will require a very active surveillance. With this, I need to thank uh, uh, Dr. K. Mohandas, who uh, uh, who made such a nice uh, uh, lecture, really nice. overview, overview and, and also led the panel discussion uh, to, in a very, uh, very uh, uh, relevant point he raised in the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Prachi, uh, for a wonderful discussion. Dr. Naveen Khatri and Dr. Pleasure. Rimpa Basu Achari. Thank you all so very much. And it has been such a pleasure. So the galaxy of uh, uh, our panelists, and they are all, all, all of them are very, very well known in their own field and coming and speak to us on, in a Sunday daytime. This is the family time on Sundays, but again, all of you spend almost two hours and sometimes yesterday also while doing a trial run. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saraswat, uh, for again taking lead into uh, master classes. Uh, thank you, all the viewers, uh, for watching uh, these classes. And uh, uh, these classes have been put into ISC website. Uh, one can view them uh, as uh, as you want to. 
and also th these uh, all these master classes are recorded into uh, the ISG page on YouTube too. Uh, for the next week, we will have a one another panel discussion, and this will be second on the master class cancer series that will be on colorectal cancer, and this will be uh, led by Dr. V. A. Saraswat. He will lead the discussion uh, on 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 this topic on the next Sunday, that is September sixth, and the panelist would be. Dr. Vicky Kapoor, who is an uh, authority on uh, gallbladder cancer, published a lot of paper, and uh, uh, he will be a surgeon uh, uh, to as a panelist. Then he, we have a Dr. Uh, Bajal. Uh, he will be again. Everybody knows uh, he will be interventional radiologist in the panel. We will have Pravi Rai as a gastroenterologist and Dr. Atul Sharma as a medical oncologist. So we'll have panel of uh, four led by Dr. Uh, Saraswat and Dr. Saraswat only identified. Lot many relevant uh, points which she is going to highlight uh, while we treat gallbladder cancer. Uh, we also uh, I want to also tell that uh, ISG abstracts for ISGCon 2020 are open, so please do submit your abstracts and full papers for young investigator and plenary session. With this, have a nice Sunday, and we see you again on September 6. Uh, have a great day, and bye bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Thank you.